right, well, in case you haven't noticed, well, there's chaos here and the Prime Minister's trying to get down to the uh, ice. Just knowing who is the Prime Minister, who is the Prime Minister in Britain, is a bit of a lottery uh, these days. They have a new one. He's a billionaire. He's the guy who actually rolled Bojo and didn't get the job. But what is happening in British politics and what is happening inside the Conservative Party who look like a disaster on speed? To find out, we are joined by a man who you very much liked last time he was on the, on the platform. He is the chief political writer for the online media organisation Spiked. His name is Brendan O'Neill and he joins us from the UK now. Brendan, lovely to have you back with us. Hi, it's a pleasure to be back. Well, quite a lot has happened since we last uh, spoke. Uh, firstly, why couldn't Truss survive as your Prime Minister? What was it, 42 days? Oh, poor old Liz Truss. I mean, part of me feels sorry for her because she just did so badly and she must feel incredibly humiliated. She's now got the accolade of being the shortest serving Prime Minister in the history of this country. And this was the woman who came into power posing like Margaret Thatcher, uh, claiming that she was the new Margaret Thatcher and that she was a lady who was not for turning. And then she turned all the way out of Downing Street and lost her job. So I do feel bad for Liz Truss, but the reason she only lasted for such a short period of time is because she was not very good. She misjudged the temperature of her own political party, the Conservative Party, she misjudged the outlook of the country itself and she tried to push through policies that no one really wanted. And as a consequence, she was nipped in the bud very quickly. So she made a huge number of political and strategic misjudgments, which means she probably had to be pushed aside. Look, I was thinking of writing a memo to the Conservative Party a couple of days ago. It would say, well, how do you run a country? A, win an election, which they've done. They've got a majority uh, in the House, right? So they are the governing party. Choose a leader and stick with them. It's that simple, isn't it, Brendan? The, the issue is, and this is something I feel very strongly, uh, everyone keeps saying to me that the United Kingdom doesn't have a presidential system. And that's completely true. We have a parliamentary system. We don't vote for an individual to run the country. We vote for a political party. And then that party runs the country. So it is within the power of that party, if they so wish, to change the leader even when they're in power. So they can go from Boris Johnson to Liz Truss to Rishi Sunak, which is exactly what's happened. Yeah. However, the truth of the matter is that in December 2019, in the general election of that month, the uh, millions and millions of people voted for the Conservative Party because they liked Boris, Boris Johnson. Johnson. Yeah. But he was a he was a colourful person. He said he was going to get Brexit done. He managed to appeal to millions of working class voters who would traditionally vote for the Labour Party because he said to them, I will get Brexit done. I will level up the country by making it more economically fair. And I will challenge wokeness and the ideology of political correctness. And that attracted a huge number of working class voters. That's why they put the Conservative Party into power. Now we have had Liz Truss, who has a very different view to uh, Boris Johnson, especially on the economy. And now we've got Rishi Sunak, who has a different view to Boris Johnson, especially on issues to do with the culture war. Rishi Sunak is not very much in favour of fighting the culture war. So he's white. So we've got Rishi is a white he, guy. He, <laughs> I wouldn't say he's woke as such, but he's certainly not keen on challenging wokeness. He thinks it's not an important issue, whereas I think it's one of the most important issues to push back the anti-British, anti-reasoned, uh, hysteria of the politically correct chattering classes who want us to think that British history is just one long list of horrific crimes, that a man can become a woman simply by clicking his fingers, that we're this is a racist country, it's a sexist country, it's a horrible country. That depressing message that is pushed by the woke sections of the elite I think that's actually an incredibly important thing to challenge. I think Boris understood that, even if he didn't always do a good job of challenging it. I think Rishi Sunak doesn't understand it, which 
which I think means that he will not do particularly well with voters, especially working class voters, when we finally get a general yeah. election. Yeah, and that's interesting because, Brendan, um, as you said, despite his, well, Eton and his toft background and that ridiculous mm-hmm. haircut and the fact that he deliberately couldn't tie yeah. his bloody tie properly, <laughs> um, Boris Johnson connected with people. And he was, as much as an English toff can be, he was a person of the people. Rishi Sunak is a billionaire, right? Yeah. Um, he's 42 years old. I'll be honest. He's not, doesn't look like the sort of the guy, guy I'd go down and have a beer at the pub with. Um, and he looks like he might live in a slight bubble. Yeah, oh, he unquestionably lives in a bubble. Uh, this is the, the great irony of Boris Johnson is that he was exactly as you describe. He was a bumbling toff. He was very, very posh. He was Eton and Oxford and the Bullingdon Club, which is this very posh club in Oxford University. He had an incredibly privileged life, but he was able to speak to ordinary people. He was able to draw the votes of working class people in the English Midlands and the north of England, the kind of people who had voted Labour for literally a hundred years. He was able to win them over to the Conservative Party by saying, I will make sure that Brexit happens. I will treat you seriously as democratic citizens and I will challenge the hysteria of the cultural elites in this country. That's what attracted people because people don't vote on the basis of Uh, wanting someone in power who looks like them. They want someone in power who will do things that they think are good for the country. Mm. With Rishi Sunak, uh, I think, I mean, it is is important that he is the first non-white prime minister this country has ever had. I mean, that is a breakthrough. That is a development. Uh, And I think lots of um, Asian heritage people in the United Kingdom are celebrating that. And I I would not begrudge them celebrating that at all. But the tragic fact is that Rishi Sunak is quite disconnected from ordinary people. He had a privileged life, as Boris did. He also is uh, uh, eye-wateringly rich, and his wife is eye-wateringly rich as well. They are richer than the King of England, as people keep pointing out. And he has lived in a bubble. He's lived in. He he went from working in the in the city, in the in the banks, in hedge funds right through to politics and right through to being the Chancellor of the Exchequer. He has very little experience or understanding of how ordinary people live. And I think that will make it a problem when he finally goes to the people and asks them for their vote. Yeah. Um, Look, just while we've got you there, um, were you aware of our attempts in New Zealand to ban Shakespeare? No, no, I haven't heard that one. Oh, I must send you some stuff, Brendan. We had a thing, a government <laughs> arts body um, declined oh. a $30,000, which is only a £15,000 uh, grant, to a Shakespeare in Schools program that's been running for 20 or 30 years on the grounds that they got someone to write a report that said his work was a canon of colonial imperialism. You know, that even though I hadn't heard that, it doesn't surprise me. And we've had similar things here in the UK uh, on university campuses, in fact, where we've had trigger warnings attached to Shakespeare plays in case students might feel offended by some of the themes that Shakespeare writes about. You know, even Shakespeare now has to be force-fielded with this warning in case it causes offence to people. And in schools in the UK... We have had people saying that Shakespeare is not relevant to ordinary, ordinary kids' lives and therefore we should do less of it. That's a, that is actually a good example of the kind of thing I'm talking about and the kind of politicians we need, which are politicians who are able to recognise how serious these kinds of issues are. I, I've, I've often argued that the culture war is not a sideline issue. It's actually one of the most important issues of our time. Mm. And if we live in countries where you cannot teach Shakespeare, where you cannot speak about your own history in a positive way, where you cannot say that biology exists and it's quite important, and where you cannot say that we're not racist, we have moved on from the past, we're not just obsessed with colonialism mm. and empire... If you can't say those things openly and honestly, yeah. then you're not going to be able well, to... Well, can I tell you, the outrage people. here was so palpable but it, that even the Prime Minister, who one would say is the Queen of Woke in New Zealand, mm-hmm. uh, the government actually intervened and got the Education Minister to say that they would fund the programme 
and that and, and the public backlash was so universal and so wide even from what I call um, the woke lovies of you know actors like Sam Neill and others well on the left yeah. uh, of the political spectrum even they could not stomach Shakespeare yeah. <laughs> uh, being vilified and it really was yeah. I, I've called it the Shakespeare moment in the culture war in New Zealand because if you like the silent majority finally said no 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 you can mess with a lot of things but don't call Shakespeare an imperialist colonialist he was the greatest writer in history you know he was the greatest playwright yeah. in history yeah, um, I think every society needs that breaking point. They need that point at which the cultural establishment just goes slightly too far. And I think they're very positive moments because that's often the moment at which huge numbers of people, not just very sensible voters, and I've always thought there are huge numbers of very sensible voters in the UK, in New Zealand and in other countries, but also other people as well, they start to realise that things are going slightly too far, becoming slightly too irrational, slightly too illiberal, and that's always a good moment to take stock and to rethink what we're doing. So I'm glad you've had one of those breaking points because they're quite important. Yeah. Uh, look, getting back to Rishi Sunak, is he the guy who essentially pushed um, Boris Johnson out? And was he always planning, actually, whether he was first cab off the rank or, as it turns out, second? His ambition always was to be Prime Minister, leader of the Tory party. Yeah, absolutely. Rishi Sunak played a key role in stabbing Boris Johnson in the back. There's no question about that. Um, you know, Boris Johnson was largely pushed out because of Partygate. These were all the parties that he had in Downing Street during lockdown when the rest of us couldn't really do anything at all. I've always thought that Partygate was exaggerated. I don't think it was as grave a crime as the media likes to think it was. Uh, you know, we're talking about literally a six minute birthday celebration in Downing Street where everyone was working anyway and all they did was gather in a room and sing happy birthday and, and all those kinds of things. These are not terrible things that they did. But the important thing to bear in mind is that Rishi Sunak is implicated in Bart Partygate as well. Everyone conveniently forgets that. He was also reprimanded for having attended some of these uh, social occasions in Downing Street. So he doesn't get off scot-free on that. But he used that scandal to drive the knife into Boris Johnson and to push him out of Downing Street because Rishi Sunak does have these great ambitions to run the country. My issue with Rishi Sunak is he's a very technocratic politician. He's a very globalist politician. He is very drawn to internationalist institutions. Oh, God, he's not he's a friend of Klaus Schwab and Macron and, and Trudeau and Adern, is he? Well, I wouldn't go that far because he was a Brexiteer. He did support Brexit, although he did support Brexit in a slightly apologetic fashion. But he did support our leaving of the European Union. So he wouldn't be as bad as people who love Ardern and, and love the European Union and so on. But he definitely is enamoured with economic orthodoxy and political orthodoxy. And he's not the kind of person who wants to rock the boat. My view is that right now, in the 21st century, what we need are political actors who are willing to rock the boat. And we're seeing them emerge. We saw them emerge in the UK with Boris Johnson and Brexit. We saw it, of course, with a Trump phenomenon in, in, in America. We're seeing it across Europe, in Sweden, in Italy, and various other countries, where people are voting for populist political figures because they are sick of the establishment, they're sick of the globalist elites telling them what they need to do, and they're voting for politicians who think a bit differently and are willing to take some political risks. And I think once we've had Rishi Sunak in power for a couple of years, the voters of this country will go back to thinking, look, we need another risk, we need another populist moment, we need to push aside these orthodox thinkers and get someone else in power who's willing to stir things up. That's happening around the world and I think it's going to happen in Britain again sometime in the future. Okay, when is the next election due in, in Britain? So the next election is due in two years, um, in 2024. Uh, there may well be one before that because, of course, it is very, very unusual to have three prime ministers 
in the space of one election period. And the Labour Party in this country is pushing very hard for a general election. Of course, they're doing it because they think they will win. I don't think they would. They could win, but that's why they're doing it. So it may well be the case that we'll have one before that. But officially, according to the law, we need to have one in the next couple of years. Two and a bit years is, is what we need to do it in. Uh, so it, it remains to be seen how well Rishi Sunak does in that time period. It, it's entirely possible that he will surprise us and that he will be a bit more radical than people think. But the signs so far are not very good. He is coming off as pretty robotic, quite orthodox, a bit cowardly in relation to the culture war and unwilling to say anything that's daring or interesting. And that's a bad sign, I think. All right. Hey, Brendan, while I've got you there, I want to test something that is going on in this country today. And I know you cover politics. Um, uh, you're a journalist. You've, you've got an objective view. In the UK, if there were a Minister of the Crown who had recommended to a government department that they hire his or her niece to a paid <laughs> government position and had declared that there may be a, a conflict of interest as a result but did nothing to ameliorate that conflict of interest and then incorrectly claimed it was departmental officials who chose the relative for the job, what would the consequences for that minister be? Wow, that sounds like a, an incredibly juicy scandal that you've outlined there. I want to know more about that. That would be, there would be quite severe consequences. That'd that be that resigned, kind of wouldn't it? In, in, yeah, that would be a resigning situation. We have had situations in this country over the past few years where people have got into trouble for employing their husbands or their wives. In oh, she also, or their sons oh, she or their also employed her husband. In a couple yeah, of jobs. So, and this niece worked for the husband's company, which also got government contracts. Yeah, that sounds incredibly fishy. And it sounds like the kind of thing we've experienced in this country as well over the past few years, where people have employed family members or friends. And basically, it becomes a bit of a racket where people are basically using taxpayers' money to give a wage to someone they love or give a wage to someone they know. Uh, and people are in the UK are very much on their guard against that kind of thing. They don't like the idea of politicians and their families being on the take, trying to make money from us, trying to bleed the system for as much cash as they can get. So uh, what you've just described would be considered incredibly controversial in this country. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was a front page story and would lead to demands for a, res a resignation. Well, it has well. been on the platform for months, but our legacy media seem reluctant well. to get into it. <laughs> yeah, that's not entirely surprising either. You know, th there is always that question, isn't there, about what the legacy media chooses to upfront and what it chooses to push to one side. And I think what's become clear over the past few years in particular is that the media often works in tandem with the political class to ensure that some stories are upfronted and other stories are pushed under the carpet. And it's always interesting to see which stories the legacy media chooses to talk about, which stories it chooses to be silent about. Yeah. Um, look, Brendan, one other thing uh, about Rishi Sunak, his wife, she's a bit reluctant to pay tax. I think they finally resolved that issue. She, there was a there was a huge scandal surrounding Rishi Sunak, which which is an example of something that the legacy media has conveniently forgotten about. There were huge scandals involving Rishi Sunak. Firstly, his wife had non-dom status, so she was not paying uh, the taxes that would be expected of her in this country. I think they've now resolved that, and she's now paying all the taxes that would be expected. The, the other scandal, of course, was that Rishi Sunak had a green card for the United States of America, even while he was chancellor here in the UK. Wow. And of course, a green card, a green card is not just a technical document. It is something where you basically say, listen, I'm my allegiance is to the United States, States of America, yeah. and I hope to I hope to live there one day as a citizen. So there was that kind of sense of uh, dual loyalty as well, and that caused him a lot of problems. But this is, these are examples of things that are slightly being brushed, brushed under the carpet. Now, I do want to give Rishi Sunak the benefit of the doubt because I want a prime minister in this country who's able to make things happen. I'm doubtful 
really that it will be him, but I'm hopeful that it might be him or it might be someone. But we'll have to wait and see what happens with that. Brendan, as always, fascinating talking to you. Thank you for giving us the litmus test on our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Māori Affairs Minister Nanaya Mahuta <laughs> and all her family connections. And I'm sure people appreciate I did that absolutely cold, so I just wanted an assessment on the facts I gave you. Um, and also, yes, we will watch uh, Rishi with, um, with great interest and we hope to talk to you again soon. As always, thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Cheers. Brendan O'Neill, Chief Political Writer for Spiked Online, an international media organisation. Wow, some really good uh, insights there. Well done, Ruby. There was a little bit of technical doing and throwing uh, to get that teed up this morning. Uh, wasn't it interesting, his reaction to me giving the hypothetical Nanaya Mahuta? He didn't really hesitate to say, that sounds incredibly dodge. What is it in New Zealand? Do we have no standards of public accountability? Is that the issue?